Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy, and we are thrilled you guys are joining us here on a Monday for what is sure to be a very emotional episode of Movie Talk. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. We have a lot of <laughs> awesome stories to get to. First and foremost, we hope you guys had a great weekend, but probably nobody around the Collider family had a better weekend than Mr. Cody Miller, yeah. Collider Woo! super fan, and he also is competing in the Olympics. He won the bronze medal in the 100 meter breaststroke, which, Snap, I know that's your stroke as oh, well. Yeah, so, Cody Miller, congratulations, <laughs> brother. Thank you for watching the show and representing our country very proudly so in Rio right now. Um, speaking of Superman, we have a breaking news scoop to give you guys about that dude. The Man of Steel apparently is being ramped into production for Man of Steel. Deal. Two, this coming to, uh, to us from a report on the rap from Umberto Gonzalez, our buddy, and he mentions that not only is that going to be a priority, they're now actively in production for Man of Steel 2, and it's one of the top things that the DC Brass wants to get to sooner rather than later. Schnepp, we just read this thing this morning at our pre-production meeting. What do you think about this? <laughs> uh, it's great. It's just like, why didn't they announce this in 2012 after Man of Steel? It's like, so we're really uh, we're lighting a, a fire under our ass it's 2000 towards the end of 2016 i think it's finally time to do man of steel 2 i'll take it any good news about seeing a sequel to the man of steel i'll take it i think it's high time that they actually lock down a release date for man of steel 2 whatever you're going to call it just call it superman whatever and the batman lock that stuff down we know there's an october and november date that dc is just floating around at some superhero films that they're going to release I think it's those two. I'm excited to hear this news. Thank you, Umberto. The hot scoop is with us. <laughs> Christian, there's an early October 2018 release date and a November 2019 release date that are still untitled DC projects. You're getting awful twitchy over here. You look excitable. Is one of these going to be Man of Steel 2? And I'm Christian Harloff. Yep. Uh, oh, thank yep. you. Thank there you, you Ashley. There um, so, yeah, I <laughs> was waiting to do the introduction until <laughs> after the Man of Wait, Steel. You can, do, you can do mine later. Yeah, yeah. Cool. and John Schnepp. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't, That's actually Mauve over there. Hey, yeah. you guys. That one. I don't know what's going to happen as far as where... They, they are definitely... They've had this timed out and play stuff for a while they just happened to announce it mm -hmm. now what i do think is that may uh you know you got you definitely have batman v superman spoiler but man, man I still do right, right. announce i mean not like anyone saw that and said well duh it's just i think that the end of that movie could have been handled a little differently if you were going to definitely just announce man of steel 2 and then i want to see it's the one that i i happen to like man of steel the best i'm, I'm a big fan of that film so i want to yeah. see the continuation of superman's story about how he's dealing with being this figure now on earth especially after all the events that have happened through batman v uh, superman. and batman v superman yeah. especially yeah Some yeah stuff so all down. this stuff so i i love the idea that we're getting a sequel man of steel i'm um and it's also to hear how enthusiastic henry cavill in general is about playing this character how long he wants to play this character yeah. please give me more I'm, i hope that they announce a man of steel three because I really want to see the, uh, his story continue. I'm a big fan of Superman. He's my favorite superhero, so please continue. It makes sense that they would want to do this. I understand why they did Batman versus Superman next after Man of Steel. They really, it, I think that their hand got forced a little bit by everything that was going on, not just in the Marvel Universe, but by the reactions to Man of Steel. They wanted to get all of their great characters into a movie and announce that this is the DC Universe going forward. So I understand it, and I think that, that going forward from that, they definitely want Superman to be playing a big role, not only in Justice, League probably part two but also have him continue his standalone franchise so this all makes sense to me Ashley who's joining me on the panel today <laughs> oh okay well John Schnepp's here hey everybody what's going on <laughs> feels like we're already into the show but I want to say one thing since we're back at me right now Star Trek Beyond if you have not seen Star Trek Beyond yet go see that you right now in the theater right after you finish watching movie talk because it is amazing it's fun I, I was blown away at how much fun I had I, you know, I take back everything I said about that sabotage music video because, man, do they set it up in such a great way in the actual film. Simon Pegg, thank you. Justin Lin, thank you. I could not believe how much I enjoyed that well, film. Well, I still haven't seen it, but Ashley, our other panelist, just saw another movie that yeah. he really loved this weekend. He also happens to be the host of Jedi Council, Christian Harlow. It's a great setup, guys. <laughs> uh, I, Sing Street was great. I would probably put it in my top two of the year so far. I saw it this weekend. Love that movie. If you haven't seen Sing Street, you can see it now. It's on demand. It's on Blu-ray. It's absolutely incredible. And I saw The Lobster. Mm. Eh. 
hipster weirdo. Yeah, it's stuff. definitely there's a lot of cool things about the Lobster. I think it was a movie that I definitely liked watching once. I don't the end of that question came up yeah. as far as what movie could, did you enjoy kind of watching the first time but never watch it again. That that might be it. But Colin Farrell's great in the movie. Uh, but Sing Street, go see it. Sing Street's great. Star Trek Beyond, I liked a little bit better. Well, I got to check out Lights Out this weekend, and uh, I'll say this about Lights Out: it's very scary, and I don't ever want to have kids. If I happen to make the mistake of having a daughter, her name's probably not going to be. Diana. Okay, <laughs> Ashley, what's our first official topic here on this Monday? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. DC's cinematic universe might be taking it on the chin as far as critical reviews are concerned, but that's not stopping the fans from flocking to see the movie in theaters. Suicide Squad, the David Ayer directed epic featuring the worst heroes ever, opened to a record breaking 135.1 million at the box office for an easy number one. Suicide Squad now holds the largest August opening weekend ever, topping Guardians of the Galaxy's 94.3 million from 2014. The film also had the largest August opening day with 65.2 million, which included the largest August Thursday preview total of 20.5 million. In the number two spot comes Universal's Jason Bourne, pulling in an estimated 22.7 million, dropping 61.6% after taking the top spot of last weekend's box office. Bad Moms took the number three spot with 14.2 million, dropping only 40.4%, bringing the 20 million budget comedy to 51 million domestic. The Secret Life of Pets took in another 11.5 million for a number four finish, and rounding out the top five was Star Trek Beyond, which took the number five spot with 10.2 million for a total of $127.9 million domestic. Mark, what do you think about the huge opening weekend for Suicide Squad? Well, Ash, I think that I'm a genius because I'm pretty sure I called this on. <laughs> Friday, and that's the first time I got the box office right since like 93. So I'm excited about it. I'm also very happy for Suicide Squad. I think this is great. It crushed Guardians of the Galaxy's previous record. And even though I didn't love the movie Suicide Squad, I love the team that I saw, and I would like to see more films in this universe. I think that's the misconception sometimes is that because I didn't rate a movie fresh or I didn't walk out loving it, that I'm rooting against it. No, I was rooting for Suicide Squad because unlike something that I just hate or something where I'm tired of, like Trans. Transformers. I think there's a lot of potential with Suicide Squad, so it's great to see all the fans that went out and, and supported this movie this weekend, because I would love to see more adventures with this team, or at least around these events, so I think it's awesome that it made that much money, and also shout out to Bad Moms Hanging On Very Strong. It's a funny movie, guys. Whatever you thought of the trailer, if you didn't, didn't think it was for you, there's a lot of laughs to be had with Bad Moms, so it's great to see that hanging in the top five. Christian, what's your takeaway from this weekend? Well, I mean, the, the obvious take is Suicide Squad and making the the money that it did it was tracking to make a lot of cash it did and it was one of, it was a lot different i think i said this uh, on friday or thursday this doesn't surprise me that the, the fan reaction, the, it was one of these things that you're really going to have a lot of fun with this movie, like you did, Schnepp, and you're going to really rave about the movie, and I think a lot of fans are having a lot of fun with it. Or you're going to say, I wish things were, were better than they were, but like Mark, I want to see more because I really enjoyed the team. I My biggest gripe of the movie was I really enjoyed the team chemistry, just wish they were on a different mission. Because of this money, hopefully we get to see them on another mission. I think David Ayer is a, David Ayer is a great director. Um, to see him do another one would be fantastic. To see them kind of continue the Suicide Squad inside of maybe not just their own standalone movie, but inside other parts of the DC Cinematic Universe is encouraging. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is a win for people who like the comic book movie genre because it is a different movie. It is a different tone. It has villains leading it. So it made it it, it, it appeased the fans. Um, maybe next time it'll appease fans and critics. We we will see the next round. Um, as far as everything else goes, I think that the two that stand out to me are both Bad Moms and, and Secret Life of Pets because they're just kind of peppering in those little 11, 12, 11, 12, and that's mm -hmm. how you make a lot of money in the long run. They're both, I mean, what what's Pets overall right now? Uh, pets is crushing it right now, and it also got greenlit for a sequel too, so yeah. it's like they, they, that, that movie, that franchise is not going away <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, Schnepp, I throw it to you because Suicide Squad, it made Scrooge McDuck money this weekend. I know that makes you really happy. It does. I actually saw it a second time last night. I saw that and Star Trek Beyond yesterday at the cinemas, and what a great double feature. Can I just say that seeing Star Trek be, be making $10 million and being the fifth after finally seeing it bums me out. I want more people to go out and see that just because I was stupid and waited, I guess, two weeks and I finally saw it. And I was like, wow, what an incredible cinematic experience. I cannot tell enough of you to go out, rush out and see it in the theater. It's 
really a good feel-good film. It's a great science fiction film. So happy to see that it's in the fifth place. I'd like to see it get up a little bit, even next week, rise up a little bit. Of course, Suicide Squad made a ton of money. Um, I'm one of those people who enjoyed it. I'm not part of the Critics Union, whatever you want to call it, um, fan club of Rotten Kids or whatever you want to call the super aggregation Motown unit that everyone's been co complaining about. The fan club yeah. of Rotten Kids? Yeah, the fan club of Rotten Kids. That's my new website. Um, so, But I really enjoyed the film. Yeah, there's problems at the end with the, hey, I'm dancing and what's going on? Weird twitch, light twitch. vortex. Where yeah, twitch, twitch. Go? Yeah, the, definitely the Axl Rose, which, uh, <laughs> apotamus. Um, but you know what? Even with the, the weak points that maybe the third act isn't as strong, some of the development of the main villain isn't there, I really enjoyed the movie overall and had a really good time with it. Amanda Waller is the most evilest villain of all time, I think. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, that's it for me. I haven't seen Born. I haven't seen Bad Moms. Unfortunately, saw The Secret Life of Stupid Pets, and I, I'm not going to see the sequel. Oh, Nine Lives. How we miss you. <laughs> that's right. Uh, we we didn't see Nine Lives either. Yeah. Not, neither did the yeah. top five. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Nope, they didn't screen it, and apparently nobody needed it to be screened. You no. Know. Sorry about that. Did it come in ninth place? What place Who knows? did it? No. The Let's cat. Let's go back yeah. to Suicide Squad and some scenes in the movie that nobody got to see this weekend. What's up, Ash? Suicide Squad just secured the record of having the biggest August opening weekend in the history of the box office. And now, as we're starting to hear more and more about the trouble behind the scenes, a user on Reddit has revealed many scenes that were cut from the film, adding more fuel to the fire that WB wanted a lighter tone than the darker cut originally planned. According to Dark Horizons via the Reddit user, the list of scenes matched some of the scenes Jared Leto revealed were cut in previous comments he made while discussing the film. They include a detailed opening of June Moon's possession by Enchantress, Deadshot in the prison cell watching the rainfall and thinking about his daughter, El Diablo being escorted to a training center and being placed in a tube that fills with water, an early interview of Captain Captain Boomerang's racism and sexism that were reportedly directed at Katana, a backstory for Killer Croc that has him ultimately crossing paths with Batman, an ace chemical scene where Harley jumps into the chemicals along with several scenes with the Joker and Harley that showed their relationship as more abusive rather than loving. Ayer has said that the theatrical cut is also his director's cut, but that doesn't mean another cut of the film is out of the question. For a full list of the scenes cut, visit Collider.com. Schnepp, what do you think about these rumors? Cut, these rumored cut scenes from Suicide Squad? Um, you know, obviously they're rumors. I mean, all of these sequences are put together by anyone could have guessed these by watching the trailers. It's just almost 85% of everything that's on that list are clips that are in the movie trailers or you know, behind the scenes, the featurettes that we've seen already. So someone is just kind of saying, all these deleted scenes, you know, they, they compromise the film and they should have been in the movie. It's like, well, a lot of deleted scenes just aren't in the film. Like the one mentioning Harley jumping into the vat of uh, uh, Ace Chemicals, that's in the movie. It was just perhaps a little bit longer. They probably had a, a longer sequence with the Joker and Harley Quinn at the very beginning when she's still... Harley Quinzel. It seems like a lot of that stuff got kind of chopped down in order to make that kind of like introductory scene for all of the main characters. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've heard for months now, you know, all of us have insider friends and they've been telling us for months that there are multiple edits of Suicide Squad. So sorry if you don't want to believe that's true, but that is true. There were multiple edits of Suicide Squad going on in tandem. One is the David Ayer cut. The other is the trailer park cut. And I even heard about a third one. So um, which one won? Maybe it's an amalgamation of both the Ayer cut and the trailer park one. Maybe it simply is the trailer park one. And Ayer is just like, look, man, it's my film. I'll just, you know, I don't want to argue about it. We we don't really know what the real behind the scenes is yet. We'll never be able to sort out yeah. all the wires behind the TV known as Suicide Squad and which movie actually came out. I do love Ayer's comments that he's standing by the movie that came out. That he's not like, oh, well, wait till you guys see my version. I think it's great for him to stand up and say, no, this is the movie we wanted to make. I think that's awesome. And Christian, when I read all these deleted scenes, we might be able to check out sometime on a Blu-ray. The one that speaks to me the most is the potential Killer Croc crossing paths with Batman. Yeah. That's the one on my list that I would love to check out more of because I didn't think Killer Croc got all of his due in the theatrical version. Which one of these scenes uh, gets your goat? That's the one because for me, it's it's it goes back to that David Ayer comment when they were talking about how they all kind of see Batman in this mm -hmm. one light. It's, it's it, with the exception of one other person who wasn't really caught by Batman. I don't want to spoil it, mm -hmm. um, but mm. they, but they, uh, you know, the fact that um, he, he, he we're going to see that or we could see that. And I also think that you know, I know some people. And Mark, you you had expressed that you're getting a little tired of the second cut 
uh, you know, why just make one cut, pick it? Because now they're going to say, oh, there's another cut that you can watch. I think it makes sense to them to if they if they have a, a longer cut, the fans are going to want to see it. The fans are going to want to watch it. I happen to like the other cuts too because I happen to, you know, it's a matter of for me if they put together and there's new scenes because for me I really like the Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition cut. Mm-hmm. I I don't think that Zack Snyder should have went and striped for a three hour movie in the first place, but the fact is he did, and the three hour movie to me works a lot better than even the original cut, and I like the original cut. So I want to see what what this new or this version with these new scenes or, or maybe a darker tone could look like. And I think it's fun. It'd be fun for fans to kind of compare the two. So I, I don't hate the idea of director's cuts. What I hate is that the weekend after the movie comes out, the studio is saying, no, I oh, saying. wait till you guys see the real movie we wanted to release. But I they're think not that's doing total that. BS. That, they're not doing they're, that. They're not doing it here. They're, and, I, and I'm happy and there about isn't that. going to yeah. be a No, I know. Cut. I know. I'm We're all on the same page. We We're having a good time today. I would like to see to see what it was. So, But I'm going to be okay when the blue Ray comes out, and they have all. If they do have a well, lot of these scenes, Ayer, Ayer went on record and said, "Look, there's a lot of stuff that got cut out. You're going to see that in the deleted right. scenes. There's over 10 minutes of stuff that got cut out. So all those scenes that we're talking about that were in the trailers, like the Joker's extra lines and maybe an extended Harley Quinn Joker scene, things like that, they're going to be in the deleted scenes. Do we have to see them integrated into the movie to make it better? Not to me. So." All right, well, uh, Ashley, we mentioned our boy Cody Miller crushing the Olympics already. Somebody else we might see the Olympics later on this week is... Jen Erso is coming to the Rio Olympics. As revealed in a new commercial from Disney and Lucasfilm, the next trailer for Rogue (laughs) One, A Star Wars Story, will air this Thursday during the Summer Games coverage on NBC. The announcement spot featuring footage from the previous trailer was caught by a Twitter user and posted online, after which Lucasfilm confirmed the trailer debut in a tweet. It's unclear exactly what we'll see, but the film's panel hosted by Gwendolyn Christie during Star Wars Celebration Europe screened footage that, among other things, revealed Darth Vader's big screen return. Rogue One, directed by Godzilla's Gareth Edwards, is set in the years between Star Wars Revenge of the Sith and Star Wars A New Hope. The latest film in the Star Wars saga is the first official standalone movie from Lucasfilm and premieres later this year on December 16th. Christian, what do you think we'll see in this new trailer for Rogue One? One. Well, I think we get a little bit more of the story for sure, and I th- also think that, this, that we talked about this on council. This made sense that this was going to happen this week because not only for the Olympics, but it, Peach Dragon comes out, mm. and it's Disney's big release. They're going to show it in in the theater, so it it, it made sense that it was coming out this week, and they kind of had to at this point because it's like, where's the trailer? I had some dope on Twitter going, they have they are following the the same exact uh, marketing that they did for Force Awakens. Not even close. They're they are not following the same. Now now they're starting to get into it by doing you know this trailer they're, by having this full trailer. We're going to get the story. We're definitely going to see Vader, and you have to see Vader. It is crucial to see Vader. I don't agree with anyone that says that. Oh, we got to like just tease it out, and then you see him in the theater. It 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 makes no sense to do that for this thing alone. There are still some people five months out that have no idea that this is not attached to The Force Awakens. There are some people out there, like, and I think it was someone on Twitter that was saying that their girlfriend was watching, like, why did they recast uh, Rey? It is crucial for them to show Darth Vader, to show them that this is a different time period. For Star Wars fans, sure. It, it, it's a, if, you, if you, for guys, the people that are locked in and know this movie's coming out, it would be nice to be teased with Vader. But for for fans who don't know what this movie is, you got to show Vader in this trailer. Yeah, I'm pretty ready to see Darth Vader as well. Yeah. That's going to be awesome to see him back on whatever screen. I actually get to watch it on this Thursday uh, evening. Uh, Schnepp, it's one of those things where, as Christian points out, even though the first trailer we had had allusions to the fact that this is not a sequel to Episode 7. We saw the freaking Death Star, right. but again, people might just be like, oh, well, that's uh, you know, that's kind of like the new Star Killer base or whatever. Right. So does this trailer have to clear clearly show us that Rogue One takes place before A New Hope. I think so. I mean, a lot of people, you know, remember there was a Death Star in Force Awakens, like you said. So they're like, oh, there's, there's another Death Star. You know, it's like, I think uh, they need to allude to maybe Grand Moff Tarkin as well as Darth Vader, just to get people on the same, you know, you seeing the old school stormtroopers, a lot of pe- a lot of people who aren't fans are just like going to say they're stormtroopers. They slight different costume. Um, seeing Vader at the end, I just wonder if, this is going to be the same like one minute teaser that they showed at Celebration. I yeah, really no don't way. think. I certainly hope it's not because yeah. I saw that and I was a little underwhelmed. I, yeah. I, in fact, like the Rogue One teaser better than whatever that one minute thing was where you just see Vader at the very end in front of a control panel with the little floaty Death Star schematic. I'm like, come on. I, if you're going to show Vader, show Vader. Show a really cool scene, something big and dramatic, whether he's in action taking people out or just 
walking in the along the beach with some stormtroopers. I don't know. I just want to see something a little bit more impactful with Vader, but I can't wait. It's a couple days. What I heard about that thing that they showed at at, uh, Celebration that no one saw was that was just going to be, no one was going to see that uh, except the people at Celebration. It was really just to give them something. They are putting together a trailer for this release. I think the plan was always to have it come out Mm. this week for the Olympics, for Peach Dragon, to put it before the theater, before you go and see Peach Dragon in the theater, they're gonna have the big trailer for Rogue One, and it's gonna be something, at this point, you have to tell me a little bit more about the story, just to say, oh, it's about the Rebels that get the Death Star plans. Not enough right now. Comes out in four months. Right, you gotta show more of, like, what am I going to see? What is the story that you're telling us now in this Star Wars story? I also think that the the celebration fallout lit a bit of a fire under their tuckers because they're like, we need to get something out sooner rather than later, and it's not just going to be the minute that they show it. I think there's going to be more new footage. I think there's going to be a lot of new footage, and I do think you will actually see, not just hear the breathing, and you're actually going to see Darth Vader as we know and love him and fear him, because that's going to be really cool. Do we know what the length of the trailer is yet? No. Eight minutes. Right. Oh, good is, God. Is, is That's a long It's going to show the whole movie. It's going to show the whole movie. It's going to air during the Rio Olympics. Right. Probably about two, two and a half. They show the whole movie and they still don't have the later in it. <laughs> right. But we're still working on them. All yeah. right. Let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to give us a topic. We'll simply say whether we buy it or sell it and the fiercest competitor wins. What's up, Ash? 20th Century Fox, the studio behind X Men, Fantastic Four, and Deadpool, previously announced they were working on another spin off, Gambit, with Channing Tatum as the lead. However, earlier this year, it was announced that Gambit had been delayed for, for for the foreseeable future for relatively unknown reasons. Now, Simon Kinberg, writer and producer of various X-Men films, has shed some light into the reasons why the film has been delayed, citing tone as the main reason. While Deadpool took 10 years in development to get right, Kinberg acknowledges that Gambit won't take as long to get right. Speaking to Slash Film about the movie in development, Kinberg said, I hope that Gambit doesn't take 10 years, but it takes a little honing to get that tone and that voice exactly right. The character has such a specific voice in the comic in the same way that Deadpool has a specific voice in the comic that we want to make sure that we capture that voice on the page. Really, it's just about getting a screenplay that is worthy of that character and I think we're really close right now. Gambit has yet to be officially dated for release, but up next we'll see Wolverine 3 on March 3rd, 2017, followed by unannounced X-Men films on October 6, 2017, March 2nd, 2018, and June June 29, 2018. Mark buys all the delays of Gambit as mentioned by Simon Kimberg. Well, I buy it because Simon Kimberg is basically telling us that they don't know when they can get Gambit out, and that's what I think we should hear. That you should stop teasing us with, oh, well, no, we're definitely gonna start shooting at the beginning of next year. We have a screenplay in place. He's like, look, I think we're close but we can't give you anything yet. And yes, we do have untitled Fox movies that are coming out. Maybe they want one of those to be the new Gambit film, but they can't put it in ink yet because they don't have it locked down the way they want. This is honesty. I like seeing this. And Simon Kimberg is a guy, if nothing else, is passionate about the properties that he represents, even with Fantastic Four, when I didn't believe a word of his comments, saying that, no, we're still going to do a sequel and all that stuff. Here, he's backed off that there's going to be an official release date announcement soon, or that even they're going to go Go into production soon. He's talking about getting the tone right. So I like that they care about this property enough to pull back and not let the fans know, oh, okay, we're going to just give you an arbitrary date and hope we can get it there. They're taking their time with this. That's what I get from these comments. How about you, Christian? I'm going to buy these comments also. I think it's encouraging. I think it's encouraging that they didn't rush this movie. They didn't spend that $200 million budget they were going to spend on this movie. It doesn't seem like fans really care that much about Gambit standalone film. There's not enough time. To, there there haven't, hasn't been enough time to develop Develop this character inside the X-Men universe and to put it out there was a potential disaster so the fact that they're, he's being honest saying ah we don't know yet it's something we want to do I mean that's honest like you're saying they, they want to do this character uh, I don't think Tatum's ever going to play the character I think by the time they get this character done it's going to be someone completely different I think that they're going to do it right I think that they finally have a lock on the X-Men franchise with the addition of Deadpool now they're going to take care of it I think that's exactly why Gambit got the kick in the ass is because it was a matter of that Deadpool did so well like wait we're in such a high here even though apocalypse didn't crush what they wanted to do it still did okay they're still in a high so let's wait introduce gambit if you're going to introduce him at all in one of the movies that have already proven itself see how we how the fans respond to him and i think that it's possible down the line but i love the comments i think it makes a lot of sense too early by schnepp Totally sell this. Uh, this is the biggest backpedaling I've heard yet from Simon Kinberg. I don't know what you guys are reading. I read the same thing, and it's like, 
why even bother announcing a movie for a year and a half, having two different directors setting actual release dates and building sets in New Orleans if your script sucks? And then you have to go back and backpedal, which is what has been going on for the last year, whether first we hear that Gambit's not going to be shot, it's going to be pushed back. Now we're hearing like, oh, we need to work on the script for maybe another, oh, hope it's not 10 years. We need to make it right for dead, like Deadpool. Well, <laughs> Deadpool was announced and they got it done in a year. That's called filmmaking. This is called backpedaling, unsure, weirdness. Like, look, maybe the script did suck, but they were going to go ahead and spend $150 million but they anyway. Didn't. I know what they did, but this happens all the time, though. And it's like, just because somebody's like kind of saying a half-truth doesn't mean I'm going to buy what they're saying. It's bullshit it's, to me. It's like, look, you, you, you guys moved forward without having everything locked down. Maybe you didn't even have Channing Tatum locked down. You didn't have anything locked down. Your directors were leaving. Things were falling apart. And then a movie that costs like $48 million made $700 million. So, yeah, I think you're going to re rethink a lot of stuff, but just say that. Don't say we're working on the script. I think that's just, you know, it's kind of lame. <laughs> I went for three buys and uh, yeah. rejected. All right, what's our next topic? <laughs> when the initial announcement that the Star Wars spinoff sorry, Rogue sorry. One would be set between episodes three and four, fans of the sci-fi saga began wondering which classic characters would appear in the film. While Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy ruled out appearances by a young Han Solo and Hayden Christensen as Darth Vader, a few other familiar faces have been confirmed to appear from the prequels, most notably that of actor. Genevieve O'Reilly, who will reprise her role as Mon Mothma from the prequels. Now, another actor has been confirmed. Has been confirmed. Speaking on the talk, Jimmy Smith confirmed he will be back as Bill Organa, Princess Leia's adopted father. While playing coy about his answer, Smith was happy to mention he has a small part that will just be a minor cameo. Eagle-eyed fans already figured Smith was in the movie when his role was briefly identified during the behind-the-scenes snippet released during. Star Wars celebrations. Whether his role truly is a minor cameo or will have a lot more to it, it remains to be seen when Rogue One, a Star Wars story, hits theaters this December 16th. Schnapp Byers saw the return of Jimmy Smith's Bill Organa in Rogue One. Well, I totally buy it because uh, Christian showed it to me last week. He was like, Schnapp, come here. <laughs> and he scrolled, he just scrolled through that clip and was like, look, there he is. I was like, oh my God, you're right. That's Jimmy Smith. Had to admit it. I love the scene from, I think it was called The Walk or The Talk or whatever that morning show is where they show that actual same clip that you showed me and like, you know, they just step through and he's like, don't people have, they have people have way too much time on their hands. Come on guys. He was like, admittedly he was busted. There he is looking at himself. He's like, Hey, it's a cameo. You know, he just said it in such a nice way. It's like, yeah, the Jimmy Smith is going to be in it. Just like I, this is a cameo. I totally buy it. He's always kind of the coolest guy in the room. And yeah. uh, so I buy that. I, I don't think he's going to have a huge part in rogue one, but I do buy that. He's going to make an appearance in there. It might not just be for one scene or it might be for a couple of those like corporate conglomeration. Are we all going to put our heads together and find out how to get these death star plants? But it seems like from that teaser trailer that we saw already, Christian Mon Mothma is running the ship as far as here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're getting the plants. And then Jimmy Smith might pop in there to be like, yeah, I think it's a good idea. How about you? I think there's a little bit more. I definitely buy it. I think that the, the whole reason, a lot of things that they're going to do in Rogue One is to really emotionally tie you into so much more that happens when episode four, when you rewatch it. How emotionally how emotionally connected will you be if right before, like towards the end of the movie, he's like, all right, and we'll meet back on Alderaan. Mm. And when you have, oh, when you, and, and when you have him say that and you know that he's going to be on Alderaan and you see him for that minute and it does connect now all the tissue... Yeah, it makes sense that he's going to be in it, and it is a cameo, but it also ties us into the fact that now we know when we watch Alderaan blow up in episode four, spoiler, um, <laughs> that, that, you know, it, that, that, that scene is going to mean so much, even if it is a glorified cameo. Yeah, he like gives the keys to the Carillion Corvette to his daughter, and he's like, oh yeah, okay, here you go, have fun racing, you got the plans, I trust you, and then, well, we know what happened from there, but we got a pretty sweet trilogy out of it, so all's fair in love and war. Okay, what's our next topic? Marvel and Disney have released the first TV spot for Doctor Strange, starring Benedict Cumberbatch as the Sorcerer Supreme. In the spot are a few new scenes that can be picked out, including a bit more of Mads Mikkelsen's villain attacking the city with the main focus still on Strange's introduction to the world of magical powers and his spiritual enlightenment. Doctor Strange stars Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange, along with Tilda Swinton, Rachel McAdams, Benedict Wong, and Mads Mikkelsen. The film opens in theaters this November 4th. Christian Byersell, the first TV spot for Doctor Strange. Um, I will. I'm. It's it's hard. I'm gonna what? buy. You're it. sighing. Well, the thing is, I'm buying the footage. I'm selling the movie guy's voice. It doesn't work in this in this spot. It just doesn't work. It's like 
Doctor Strange coming in IMAX. Like, ah, I was just invested in everything I was seeing here. Get out of here. I love that guy. And it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's an iconic voice. You know, you hear it. But it didn't work. And it just shows to even more when they had that hologram to King uh, movie, when they did the whole thing. It just doesn't work anymore. Right. It's still interesting to hear and fun because of nostalgia purposes. But the particular trailer, the stuff that we saw, the footage, yeah, it looks great. I buy it. I can't wait to see Doctor Strange. It was a lot of the same stuff that we saw at Comic-Con. But this trailer is like, come out at IMAX. Oh, see, right, it's great. Yeah. It's like, no, just let me see. Let me get invested. And they speed so, him up a little bit, it too. Was, it, it was, it like was. So I, I didn't, I didn't like the trailer in that aspect, but the stuff that we actually see in the story itself, yeah, then I buy that. So I'm buy and sell the movie guy. <laughs> I'll buy the trailer, yeah. I mean, I, I like the footage. I think it's a great TV spot because, again, especially with the TV spot, you really want to sell the movie to people who haven't been previously introduced to what's coming out in theaters. I think this does that magnificently so. So in the uh, late 80s, Schnepp, you had the advent of the trailer with the movie Boys. In a world, Mark Ellis. You, the in a world guy started coming to prime prominence in the late 90s yeah. and then in the early 2000s Pablo Francisco had a great bit about it and then he actually passed away about five or six years ago I believe and so now it seems like maybe even just for TV shows you're still trying to emulate that classic mm. voice what do you think about the voice and about the trailer you know what the uh to me, it didn't bother me as much as it did Christian. I, I buy the trailer and I buy the little guy at the end, the sped up, like coming in IMAX and like really quickly, just trying to get that information out, I'm sure. But yeah, I mean, on a side note, I do kind of miss the weird, like, they started out as a family. And then there's yeah. two clips and they're like, you don't love me. Then they fell apart. I'm leaving, you know, with intersperse with dialogue, but then the, the narrator guy shows up. I mean, that was like, they really stopped doing that. I implore them to bring that back. No, I don't. Let's just talk about Doctor Strange. Great stuff. In fact, they show a lot of clips from stuff that they showed to everybody in Hall H, the teach me scene and certain things that they, they showed in Hall H, they clipped into this TV spot, which I definitely love i like seeing uh mads mickelson like do some kind of imploto explodo weird mm -hmm. inception type stuff i mean it, it looks really fun i think you know i cannot wait to see it and it, they did a really good job at putting everything that is going to be Doctor Strange into this trailer, so I buy it. Fun movie trailers to watch on YouTube at some point. Predator and Die Hard because it's just it's it's the, the before the end of world guy, but it's just like they they do not make them like that anymore. Yep. Probably for the best. All right, what's our last buy or sell? It's been said many times by industry insiders that the MPAA doesn't really care about violence in movies as long as it's bloodless. You can usually pack as much violence as you want into your movie and get away with a PG-13. Comedian and filmmaker Mike Burbank. Biglia has recently given his two cents on the matter, putting the PG-13 rating of Suicide Squad in his sights. Berbiglia's new film, Don't Think Twice, was recently given an R rating because the actors in the movie occasionally swear and smoke pot. The official reason given for the rating includes language and some drug use. Some are saying that's a low blow for a movie that is perfectly acceptable for the 14 and over set, all of whom will be able to buy tickets to see Suicide Squad, which earned its PG-13 rating despite continuing containing a large amount of violence and gunplay. Berbiglia made his thoughts known on Twitter, saying, Suicide Squad has machine gun killings and bombings and got a PG-13 rating. Don't Think Twice gets an R because adults smoke pot? Uh, confusing. Director Judd Apatow then jumped into the discussion, responding to the tweet and saying, Studios own the ratings board. Violence sells, so they make pot and sex a scary thing, so they seem caring. This conversation shines a light on a bigger discussion many have regarding the MPAA ratings, which many consider to be outdated and only benefiting the studio marketing division rather than moviegoers. Mark, buy or sell the comments made by Berbiglia and Judd Epitau. I totally buy what Mike and Judd are telling us that the MPAA, for whatever reason, they, they don't regard violence in the same way, particularly language too. Like th There's just this golden rule that will never go away with the MPAA, that if you have two or more f-bombs in a movie it's automatically rated right. r like are you kidding me did you see suicide squad how violent that movie is it's crazy that that would be rated pg-13 and something like don't think twice which has a little bit of drug use and some f-bombs would be rated r it's so stupid and what it is it's outdated and and they they mention as much in their comments where i understand that and i think it's a good thing that, that there's a guide for for parents out there for people for whoever the governing bodies of a town are that, oh, you can go see this movie for this age, but maybe you're not old enough. I understand that. I, I, I get the mission, but it seems, Christian, as we go further and further with this, that it just, these ratings are not working, are not serving their purpose anymore. I buy it, but I feel like we've been having this conversation about the MPAA forever 
ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like it, it's beyond ridiculous. And whether it's it's an American thing too that like nudity and sex gets rated R. It's like I mean, come on. It's certain certain things depending on what it is. Like you can shoot up if for the beginning of Jack Reacher. When you look at the beginning of that movie, and Jack Reacher's, is it, that might be actually R. Is that movie R can't or is it PG-13? I can't Searching. remember. Searching. Searching. Or it was born. One of these, one of these, there was like a really intense kind of shoot em up. Um, and, and you could see where it could be a disturbing thing, but then you look at a particular F bomb that's thrown out or nudity, and then they throw R, you know, to American Pie or whatever it might be. And it's, it's outdated. It's it really is. It just depends on what what they're looking at, and I think it's it's just a matter of society. It's a matter of of culture, and it's a matter of I, I don't know morals. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's it's really hard. It's been going on for a very long time. But it, I I agree with what you said and what they said. It's just outdated. Uh, Jason Bourne and uh, Jack Reacher both PG thirteen right, right. films. Schnapp, pretty silly. Pretty darn silly. I think the MPAA has got to go through a major reform. I think it's very puritanical. It's might as well they might as well call it the Pilgrim Squad. A witch. I mean, it's yeah, it's literally uh, very much like church and state kind of run. It's got a lot of people who are like ultra religious in charge of like making decisions as far as creativity, which really don't go hand in hand. So. I've been against the MPAA for a while. Every, you guys do yourself a favor and watch the documentary, This Movie Is Not Yet Rated. I believe that's what it's called. It's all about the MPAA. Check it out. It'll upset you. So, And I think they should uh, They should really, uh, all of the all of the studios should get together and kind of force the MPAA to redo their their, uh, their rating system. Yeah, I think. I think we're starting to realize, too, around the world that violence is a lot more harmful than nudity or sex or drug use or anything else. So maybe we should factor that in consideration going forward with the MPAA's ratings. I don't necessarily want Suicide Squad to be rated R, by the way. I, right. I like that. Right. I think it's a it's a fair PG-13, but it's like, come on, you, you drop a couple F-bombs. It's a, the, the kids are doing improv. Let them have their fun. All right, now we move on to our own Wendy Lee, who's been monitoring the chat room thus far, watching all you guys and your little borbs. Now, Wendy, I do want to talk about the rating thing because I'm sure that's going to get a lot of people talking. But let's go back to the box office of Suicide Squad. What are the fans saying? Well, some are already speculating that Suicide Squad is going to fall hard next weekend that, and that it only did well because it didn't have much competition. Uh, Fatty Like says... Suicide Squad did much better than I expected, though I thought that it wouldn't even hit 100 million because of the bad reviews. And Sanity is Radical says Suicide Squad had infinite potentials, wonderful characters wasted on one of the weakest stories I've ever seen from DC. And moving on to our buy or sell section, talking about the uh, MPAA rating. Well, so our chat can never agree on DC or Marvel, but they can agree that the rating is super outdated and when will we see a change? B. Zerger says, I could never figure out whether the MPAA is made of board housewives or stick up the butt Puritans. I, uh, I agree with some of that, but I also think that Suicide Squad is not going to have the drop-off that a lot of people are expecting. No, I don't no, think it will at all. Nope. L- look at the competition it has coming out. It did pretty well to go up against Jason Bourne, Star Trek, and completely annihilate those, even though they were in their second or third week of release. But this weekend, you got Sausage Party, Pete's Dragon, Florence Foster Jenkins. Sausage Party might be the best competitor to Suicide Squad. I think Suicide Squad has got a great chance to be number one again. I think it definitely will be number one again. And the thing is, August is the magic month if you can get it right. Apes did it. Um, Guardians. And Guardians did it. And now Suicide Squad. If you can hit in that first week in August, you've got a gold mine because mm-hmm. it, it be, there will definitely be people that will be going back and because everyone's talking about it it's a different spot than than even march it's a different spot than this the heart of august i mean heart of june and july that's hard to do but if you can hit in august you've got a good chance to have a mega hit and it looks like they have one and speaking of the ratings board a sausage party coming out this weekend that's a movie that should definitely be rated r yes <laughs> and pete's dragon has a naked dragon through the whole thing so take that for <laughs> right. what's worth all right let's move on to mailbag on we the end. you guys that at the end of the show we're going to to save a little bit of time for your live Twitter questions, go ahead and tweet us right now at Collider Video. In the meantime, let's go to Mailbag, where you guys can email us your questions anytime. We'll answer them here or on our weekend shows. Mailbag, Collidervideo at gmail.com is where you want to send your queries. What do we got today, Ashley? Orlando Orego writes, hey guys, I love all the new shows. My question may need to be explained to fans that may not know what I'm about to ask. So I was wondering about the Flash movie and the bad reception DC movies are getting. Do you think Flashpoint can fix the DC movie universe? With the critics not liking B versus S and Suicide Squad, it would be smart for WB to just reset the universe. I understand that Wonder Woman and Justice League coming out, but Flash could fix the problems with what's happening with the universe. 
and in 2018 we will have solo movies for Aquaman, Batman, and finally a Man of Steel 2. What do you guys think? Thanks for taking my question. Um, I think that it's way too much potential to punt on what DC has building on what they have going forward, regardless of what you think about Zack Snyder. I think that there's so much goodness in the future of DC that you don't pull the plug on this thing, even though you might have an out with Flashpoint. So, Schnepp, can you explain to our fans really quick what that would entail? Yeah, Flashpoint. You know, if they do that with the Flash, it's basically him discovering all these alternate worlds and possibly being able to smash them all together like in the flashpoint only he was aware that all these the past really existed when they created this brand new universe so um i don't think they're going to do that i think if they were going to do anything like that it would be to show that there's these alternate worlds that exist and they would be able to show the the uh you know the dc television world or the cw world coexisting at the same time as the dc cinematic universe they're just different parallel universes and flash could do you know jump through and like the grant version of the flash from the tv show could like star with uh you know with the movie version of the flash i mean i would see that more as a potential than to meld or try to fix whatever some certain people would see as you know things that they want to change i don't think a lot of people want to change things i think they're moving forward with their game plan and they're going to keep moving forward with wonder woman then you're going to have justice league you have all these other films now we just heard man of steel's being put out the batman so they're definitely following through with their cinematic universe if they do anything they're going to say look we're part of a parallel universe and spotlight the CW universe in the same movie. I think that could be really cool by doing a crisis on infinite earths kind of thing with the flash. You have to take that. I've said this before. You have to take the flash movie and up its game because it's got a competing television show right now. So you need to make it even bigger. So that's the way to do it. What says the horror off? I think that Schnepp's right as far as I want to see how they are first doing all this DC cinematic universe stuff. And then after you introduce the flash, you know, they to have them play with time a bit because they even did, it in Batman v Superman, mm -hmm. you know. So if they if they're able to do it down the line after they've kind of connected everybody, I I'd be okay with it. I think it'd be kind of cool if they did Flashpoint. Then it's like Star Trek, where like you could have the old meeting the new. So Adam right. West Batman could come in and like pitch in with Ben Affleck's Batman. That's the movie I think we all want to see. Yeah. All right, let's move on to live Twitter questions. We save some time for a couple Twitter questions. Ash, we'll do two today, making it even two. Right. What's up first? Alan Reed writes, "Which character death was satisfying to you?" Spoiler alert. Which character death in anything, in anything ever was satisfying to me? Like, yep. yeah. Oh boy, that's a lot of character deaths we're talking about. All right, I'm gonna stick one out right, right away. Roy Batty in Blade Runner. Satisfying, sad, emotional, had to happen. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go with one that, I, that it really upset me at the time. And because uh, I didn't see this movie until like way after everybody else had seen it, but it didn't get spoiled for me, is I was so with Million Dollar Baby. Mm. I was so with watching it, and I hated the ending at the time. Right. And then it made more sense to me going on. So even though it's probably the reason why I won't go back and watch that movie again, I think it makes sense. Uh, the And I think that just to close the circle of life that we get, sometimes you do need even the dog to die with like an old yeller situation or a Marley and me. It's as sad as it is. It's it's closing the circle and making everything complete. Christian, I know you're a big Mufasa fan. Yeah, no, I got, I got three. I got two by the same actor, uh, which is Al Pacino, Carlito. Kind of had to happen. It even happens pretty quick. Um, and then Tony Montana sure. is another one. You greatest death sequence. It's only so mm -hmm. long that guy can survive. Right. But William Wallace in Braveheart. Mm. I mean, when that happened, I remember seeing that movie. I'm like, oh, his friends are gonna save him. I'm like, no. Well, his guts are coming. I, I don't. I don't think they're gonna save him now. Uh, but like, you <laughs> see why it happens. It, it it's kind of it kind of has to happen for everything that he his his mission, everything about freedom. So yeah, that was the one that hurt the most, but understood why it had that. Were you that kid that like waited for the credits to roll? You're waiting for a post credit scene. Like, come on, he's gonna. They're gonna sew this I really up. Thought, this is gonna be fine. I really thought his buddies like Robin Hood style were gonna save him, and I'm like, did not did just stand in there watching this. This yeah, is, this can't is, do yeah, anything. Yeah. Pretty rough. Yeah. Ash, is there a death scene in a movie that really affected you? As um, a human? Yes, I know you guys hate The Amazing Spider-Man 2, along with basically everybody, but I cried my eyes out when yeah. Gwen Stacy died. The sound that her head makes when it... I, like, I was like taken aback in the theater. I was so sad. Oh, my gosh. You know, so. I, I felt a sigh of relief when the movie ended. <laughs> 
So you were happy when she died, basically. Yeah. You were satisfied with it. Glad you guys were sitting on opposite ends <laughs> of the table. All right, let's do one more Twitter okay. question. Mark writes, what movie review have you given that brought you the most fan backlash? Oh, <laughs> oh boy, there's been a number of them. Uh, Suicide Squad didn't help matters. Batman vs. Superman didn't help matters. Man of Steel didn't help matters for me. Um, I'm going to go with two that stick in my head is the is is Mirror Mirror, Oof. which I really enjoyed, and yeah. uh, apparently people didn't care. And the other one is actually the opposite, where I loved the movie and I got a lot of hate for it, was 13 Hours. It wasn't I, that you loved it. 13 it was, Hours? I loved it. You gave it the score. It w I gave it That's five out of five schmoes, right. but I've had a lot of people tweet me and tweet us at schmoes know and say, you know what, I thought it was silly at first, but after watching 13 Hours, I agree with you. So I've had a lot of fan support. I think a lot of times when you get backlash as uh, if you're reviewing a movie, it all comes in waves, and mm -hmm. then people see how much you're, hate you're getting. Then they're like, well, let me check out what's going on here, and then it starts to turn the tide the other way. So if you give sure. it enough time and space that people will eventually see See the side that you're on. I think that's awesome. Uh, Schnepp, the worst backlash you've ever gotten reviewing a movie. Well, it was probably uh, Batman v Superman. I would say that's the, the right theatrical answer. cut, just because. And I stand by it. I still think that that version of the film is pretty bad. Uh, doesn't make sense. And you know, a lot of people like were trying to explain it to me. I remember in some of the like, look, this is the story. It's like I never had a problem with the story. I under completely understood the story. I didn't like the way it was put together. And then the ultimate cut obviously showed, oh, this is with the sequences put back in the way, in the order that they're supposed to be with other additional scenes, how the movie should have played. And so, you know, and I end up liking the ultimate cut quite a bit. Uh, so, yeah, Batman v Superman was the biggest one. Probably The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was another one where I got a lot of backlash. But, hey, whatever. And the backlash continues in the chat room. Christian, you were nervous about Suicide Squad because you didn't love it and you wanted to. What are some other movies that maybe gave you that that hurt? Um, the one that's actually Cloud Atlas. I know, it was weird because like I, I, I don't know a lot of people who love that movie, but in when I reviewed it, there were a lot of fans that were, that the ones that did like it, man, brutal in that room. But, uh, you know, it happens. It's part of the job. Yeah, it's part of the job, and this is the best part of the job because we get to hear from you guys. So make sure y'all comment on this vid right now. You're still going strong in the live chat room. Let us know your talk on all of the movie stories that we just yapped about. I want to thank everybody that helped us pull off this production here today, both behind the camera and up front here at the table with me. First and foremost, our own Wendy Lee. Where can everybody find you online, Wendy? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And Mr. John Schnapp, I did such a good job introing you today. Hey. And now the outro. Where can everybody find the you? The outro is at John Schnapp. Uh, what is it? Facebook, uh, Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, all those social medias. Bye. <laughs> You sound like a mad scientist who just right. invented all of them. Oh, you know, I show, just came up with all of them. Show, There's also Scoobly Boobly and Collider Heroes tomorrow. And the host of Collider at Jedi Council. That would be Christian George Harloff. Where can everybody find you? Yeah, Twitter and Instagram. But Friday is the biggest rematch we have had so far. It's Scott Mance and John Roca, part Mance. two. These two crazies go at it on Friday. And the winner advances into the Ultimate Schmodown tournament. Who do you guys think is going to win? Ooh. Right now, it's Roca by that much the fans by that much so Star Trek curious. versus Bespin I know Bespin poor Bespin and Ashley Mova where can everybody find you Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. Happy Monday, guys. Indeed, a lot of fun stuff coming your way right here at Collider Video all week. Make sure you guys check out our friends at AMC Theaters. That's where you go for all the box office and showtime ticket information. Just go to amctheaters.com and bookmark collider.com. That's where we go for a lot of our movie news stories that we report to you guys each and every weekday. And I said subscribe here, so I'm sure you already did it. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Oh, check us out on Goku, Roku, and uh, Apple TV. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> More on that tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.